Rowan. The interview with Mr. Sherwin Glazer, 24 January 2001, at the Syracuse Armory. Uh, interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hasselm. Uh, videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Glazer, where were you born and raised? I was born in Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, uh, November 11th, 1924, and I was raised here and lived here all my life. And uh, you graduated from high school here? I graduated from Nottingham High School in Syracuse, mm -hmm. and I started Syracuse University uh, in, no, in the fall of 1942, I, I, I was able to finish one semester, and that's when I was called into the Air Force, into the Air Corps, I should say, because it wasn't an Air Force at the time. I had enlisted, but they didn't call me until about January of 1942. And then I was in the Air Force, about uh, Air Corps, about 32 months. And then I was uh, honorably separated. I went back to college at Syracuse University, finished my four years. And after that, I went into business with uh, uh, two brothers and my father and we were in business. I was in the business 40 years, and then I retired in 1989. Uh, did you marry? Oh, yes, yes. I married in 1952. Uh, My wife's name is Lillian. She's from Newark, New Jersey. And we have two children, a boy, Brad, who's about 46 years old, lives in Beechwood, Ohio and our daughter Julie, who is about 43 years old, and she lives in Somerville, New Jersey. And uh, we have uh, five grandchildren. Let's go back to um, your time in Syracuse University. Okay, and uh, do you recall where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I do. I was 17 years old. Uh, we had a Sunday morning bowling league, and I was at the bowling alleys. And we heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And of course, nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was, nobody ever heard of Pearl Harbor. And being at that age, we really didn't realize at first hand the significance of what that meant until like a day or two later when President Roosevelt uh, got on the radio and made his famous speech. And uh, that's when we started realizing, and, and it was in the news all the time, of course, and that's when we started realizing how important it was. Did you begin to think that it might have an impact on your life? Well, yes, yes, because uh, I had two older brothers uh, one went into the Air Corps before me. He enlisted also into the A Air Corps. And he was the middle brother. I was the youngest brother. He was the middle brother. My oldest brother was not in the service. He had very high blood pressure. He died at the age of 48. Um, uh, so after my brother left, and then as friends were leaving, um, the question is, what was I going to enlist or was I going to wait and be drafted? Many of my friends were being drafted. My brother had enlisted in the Air Corps ahead of me and he went into the aviation cadet program of the Air Corps where when you graduate you become an officer. Um, he became a uh, radar operator in a P-61 night fighter, and their main job was uh, bombing and strafing military targets at night in France, because France was occupied territory at that time. 
So uh, he advised me to do the same thing, to also enlist in the Air Corps and try to get into the cadet program, aviation cadet program. But at first they were only taking college graduates. I was five years older than my brother and I had only had one semester of college. Well, they were running out of college graduates, so they started taking high school graduates. And they, and they improvised a five-month program where they sent you to college for five months and taught you what they think that you needed to know. And I was sent, well, bef of course, before that I went to basic training. I was called in January, 40. Three. I was called in January of 43. Uh, we went to basic training in Atlantic City for about 30 days. Um, our training there consisted mainly of lectures, marching, and movies, training movies. Uh, we were there about 30 days. From there, I was sent to this five-month college program that I just mentioned, uh, which there was one at Syracuse University, but I wasn't lucky enough to go there. I was sent to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And so we were there about five months. Um, uh, but I'm sorry getting ahead of myself. In order to get into the Air Corps program, I had to take examinations. Uh, a bunch of us, like several hundred of us, were called downtown to the old post office building, which no longer is standing. And we took these examinations and they told us to wait out in the hall after the exams were over. They told us to wait out in the corridor. And um, one by one they called names. And as they called your name, you went back into the room. So. They kept calling names, and um, I was one of the few toward the end whose name wasn't called, and there were only a few of us left out in the corridor. I was beginning to think that we who were left out in the corridor had failed the exams. It turned out that we were the ones that were accepted, and those ones who were called into the room were not accepted. So anyhow, that's when we went to um, uh, Atlantic City for basic training, 30 days. Uh, besides having the training lectures and things like that, we had certain tasks like guard duty, KP, things like that. Uh, I was in the service about two weeks when I was on guard duty on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, which of course was blacked out. So I was out on the boardwalk of Atlantic City with the ocean over here and the hotels over there and you couldn't see anything because everything was dark. And somebody came along to me and I was trained to say, who goes there? So he answered me, the NCOD. Well, I was in the service two years, uh, in two, two weeks. I said, what does that mean? What does NCOD mean? He said, non-commissioned officer of the day. And he shone his flashlight on his armband, said NCOD. <laughs> so I, I let him go, because I couldn't stop him anyhow. I had no weapon. <laughs> um, and after, after uh, about 30 days in Atlantic City is when we went to Williamsport, PA, to take this five-month college program. And then if I have my order straight, we were sent to Nashville, Tennessee Classification Center where they classify you either for pilot tra training, navigator training, or bombardier training. Um, I went into uh, navigator training and um, Okay, I was sent to Maxwell Field, Alabama, which is where you become an aviation cadet. The discipline was very, very strict and strong. They brace you, 
and uh, you have to call everybody Mr. And uh, it was very hot and crowded. And sometimes we would let our showers run, the cold showers in our room, we'd let it run just to try to cool down the room. There was no such thing as air conditioning in our rooms. Um, so we were there in, the, in Maxwell Field, Montgomery, Alabama, about a month. And I went to uh, primary uh, 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 navigation school in in um, in uh, Florida, right outside of Miami. I can't think of the name of the little town. At the University of Miami is there. Mm -hmm. Coral Gables. They, uh, I went to navigation school at Coral Gables, Florida, right outside of Miami. The school was run by civilians. It was run by Pan American Airways. Civilian instructors. And we flew in Pan American amphibians, which landed in the water. And um, we flew around the islands. That's where we learned celestial navigation. And we took our classes in the classrooms at the University of Miami. As I recall, I think the Air Corps had taken over the whole university because I don't recall there being any civilian students there. And um, then um, I graduated from Navigation School, September 30th, 1944. I got my wings and my lieutenant's bar. And uh, the next step was forming our crew. And they sent us to Avon Park, Florida. There was a big Air Force, Air Corps base, a B-17 base, where they formed the crews. That's where I met my pilot, my co-pilot, my flight engineer, my radio operator, ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and a tail gunner. And we took training missions in Florida until they thought we were ready to leave for Europe. Some of the guys went by uh, ship, by troop ship to, to England. We were lucky enough to fly our own bomber over there, B-17 bomber. Uh, we took off from um, Bradley Field, Connecticut. And our first stop was Goose Bay Laboratory. Then I think we had another stop in Greenland and then Iceland, Keflavik, Iceland. There are two main cities in Iceland, Reykjavik and Keflavik. Reykjavik is the larger one, but we landed at Keflavik. And because of the weather, we were there two weeks, whereas we were only supposed to be there like overnight. Because of the weather, we were there two weeks because of the weather. And it was um, like, uh, February or January, it was winter, the middle of the winter, and because of that, the sun was in the southern hemisphere, so we were getting mostly nighttime, and uh, it, which takes getting used to <laughs> uh, darkness most of the day. And um, from there, after two weeks, we flew down to England. We were warned before we took off, especially me and, and the other navigators, we were warned not to rely too much on our radio compasses because the Germans had installed a radio station in Norway. And if we homed on that radio station, we would have become involuntary guests of the Germans for the rest of the war. So they had, they had warned us about that. 
so we, we arrived at our base, okay, and uh, this was in January of 43, 1943. Um, we, were, we lived in a barracks, and luckily my brother, who was in the 9th Air Force in France, had finished his tour of duty and was coming back to the United States. He found out where I was, and he arrived at my base the day that I arrived there. And he spent that night with me. He slept right next to me in the barracks. Uh, fortunately, there was an empty bed next to me. I don't know, maybe it was unfortunate. Maybe that fellow had been shot down. <laughs> maybe that's why there was the empty bed next to me. So anyhow, that's why my brother spent the night right next to me. And I remember that first night uh, in the barracks, we were awakened by one of the fellows in the barracks having nightmares from his missions. And he was crying out. And we were awakened by that. And we didn't know what it was until somebody else explained it to us. Then the next morning, my brother had to leave to go back to the States. Um, he was assigned to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. I think he was a statistician. And uh, we commenced our uh, bombing missions, my crew. And my first mission was with an experienced crew. It wasn't with my own crew. And they do that on purpose just to give you experience. After that, my missions were with my own crew. And um, I have here a diary of my missions. And I flew 11 bombing missions between March 8th, 1945, and March 30th, 1945. And um, the, some of the targets were Gießen, Soest, Hamburg, Swinemundi, Hanover, Olderberg, Rattingen, Gieseke, Olderberg again, Hanover again, and Hamburg again. And the toughest mission of all was the second one to Hamburg. Uh, that was the most dangerous one where we ran into the most opposition. Uh, we had 11 holes in our plane from uh, anti-aircraft fire. Five of the holes were up in the nose where I was stationed and the bombardier was stationed. And um, I have here one piece of flak or shrapnel which came in, excuse me, which came in through the right side of the nose. My navigator's table, I'm facing the front of the nose. Navigator's table is on the left-hand side. I was facing my table. This came in through the right-hand side of the nose, just came past my arm by just a few inches, grazed the top of my table, and bounced off the table and hit the left-hand wall. And by that, it, it had expent enough energy so that it didn't go through the left-hand wall. It bounced back and just lied on my, on my table. And uh, I picked it up and I put it in my pocket, thinking it would make a good souvenir if I ever got home to show it. Uh, if you would hold it. In oh, I'm sorry. No. OK. This is about, I would say, what, three inches long? Very ragged and jagged. And at one time it was very shiny. Through the years it has become, you know, tarnished and rusty. And um, uh, so that was uh, our worst mission. Um, so I flew 11 combat missions and then we would have flown more missions only we were our crew was put into lead crew training. And that took us out of combat for several weeks. 
and um, by the time we were finished with lead crew training, uh, the war was practically over in Europe. They sent us on some food missions, dropping food in the Holland, in, in Holland, in the uh, Netherlands. The Germans had flooded the dikes, and there were vast farmlands that were flooded. There was a, a scarcity of food, and um, many of the Dutch people were almost starving. So they sent us on these food missions to drop food in certain designated cities. And we flew, we had to fly at low level so as not, when we dropped the food, so that the cartons of food would get damaged. We flew at, uh, at 1,500 feet, which normally when we were on a bombing mission we could be flying anywhere from 25,000 to 35,000 feet. Uh, we flew at 15 hundred feet, and when it was time to, to actually drop the food, we were down to about 400 feet, and we were really sitting ducks for anti-aircraft fire, but we didn't, uh, we didn't come across any anti-aircraft fire. Um, uh, two of those food missions, one was to Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, two were to Amsterdam. Um, Utrecht and Amsterdam, that was on May 2nd and on May 3rd, were still in enemy hands. But on our second mission to Amsterdam, which was on May 6th, the Germans had left. And um, a lot of the Dutch people were flying Dutch flags from the tops of their houses. It was a nice sight. Then after that, on May 18th and on May 25th, on May, 8, on May 18th we flew down to Linz, Austria. This is from our base in England. We flew down to Linz, Austria, where we picked up about 30 displaced persons. I think they were people that the Germans had taken from France and used them for forced labor in Austria. And so we flew them home to Paris. And um, we dropped them at an air base near Paris. We flew over the city of Paris just to see it. And then we went back to England. And then on the um, 25th of May, uh, we went back to Linz, Austria again, um, to pick up French civilians. Uh, this was a five-ship squadron which we led, and we flew to Merville. After, after we picked them up, we flew to Merville, deposited the French, and then we returned home. On the mission before that to Linz, uh, it was also a five-ship uh, five squadron, which we led. And we uh, followed the Danube River for 100 miles up to Nuremberg, then proceeded to Mannheim, Saarbrücken, and then we landed north of Paris. We, de we deposited the prisoners, flew over Paris, and returned to our base uh, in England, flying through thunderstorms. Um, well, anyhow, then the, the war was over, and we all had to come back to the States, because we were one of the lead crews. Many of the higher officers at our base decided to come back with us in our plane and they flew back in our plane, maybe like three or four of the higher officers at our base. Uh, the name of our base was Great Ashfield, and it was in Elmswell, right near a little village called Elmswell, which was uh, north of London. Um, we had to make one stop. There was one stop on the flight plan coming back from England. We 
landed in the Azor Islands at 1247 p.m., which was exactly my ETA, 1247 p.m. I looked out the nose of the plane and there were the Azor Islands down below us. I went into the PX and I found a working there, a friend of mine here from Syracuse. He was a clerk in the PX behind, a, behind one of the counters. And uh, we were just there overnight and we flew back to the United States and um, we were sent not as a crew, we were broken up as a crew. Uh, I was among a group that was sent to Sioux Falls, South Dakota to prepare for B-29 training because the war in the Pacific was still going on. So I was there in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, and it was just a pool. There was no training going on. It was just a pool. And I was there about a month. And then President Truman wisely decided to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. And of course, then the war was over. And I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And that's where I was separated from the service. And I came home. Um, this was in the summer of 1945. And I don't remember the exact month, but something like June, I would guess. And um, then in the fall, I, that fall, September 45, I went back to Syracuse University and finished up there. I had three and a half semesters to go. I finished up there. Graduated in 1949. And... Um, uh, went to work with my two brothers and my father. My father passed away in 1948, so then it was just my two brothers and myself. And then my oldest brother, the one who did not go in the service because of his high blood pressure, he died in 1960 at the age of 48. And so then it was my middle brother who had been in the 9th Air Force and myself. And so we operated our business until 1989, uh, when I was 64 years old and he was 69 years old. We had both had heart attacks within a short period of each other. And so we decided to retire, which we did. Since that time, I've had two heart surgeries. Uh, the one was about... 18 years ago, and the second one was about five years ago. And um, in 1952, uh, or I should say in 1951, I met my wife Lillian, who was from Newark, New Jersey. I met her on a vacation trip. A friend of mine, actually two friends of mine, three of us went away on a vacation trip. Two of us met these two girls from Newark, New Jersey. One of my friends married one girl and I married the other one. <laughs> and they had five children, but they're divorced now. And we had two children. And uh, as I said before, my son lives in Ohio and my daughter lives in New Jersey. And my son has two children, my daughter has three children. And that brings us pretty much up to date. Do you want to show us the, uh, the medal? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, one of my decor well, actually, my main decoration was an air medal, which is uh, a medal which only the Air Corps gave out. Um, I received the air medal. And then, instead of duplicating a an award, if they decide to give it to you again, instead of giving you another air medal, or whatever medal it is, they add an oak leaf cluster to it. So I was awarded the air medal and then an oak leaf cluster. This is what it looks like.
And of course, New York State gave all its veterans a uh, uh, some kind of New York State medal, as I recall. I have that home also. Um, what else can I say? Well, you can answer a few questions for us. Okay, fine. Um, let's go back again to uh, Syracuse University and the city of Syracuse. Okay. 1940, 41, 42. Uh, after we were in the war, uh, what was life like in Syracuse? I mean, well, uh, when, when, let's see, the war broke out in 41. I was 17 years old. Uh, and I left when I was 18. I left for the service when I was 18, so I actually wasn't here very long, you know, after the war broke out. But I can remember practice uh, air raids. Uh, the sirens would go on, everybody would turn off their lights, and there would be an air raid warden in each block, and people would close their drapes to uh, you know, not to let any light out of the houses. You know, they, they tried to uh, uh, to pretend it was an actual air raid. Did people really think the Germans might bomb Syracuse? Why? Uh, I, I don't think so, not yet, but it was always a possibility later on, depending upon how the war went. So did they take the air raid wardens, uh, air raid wardens seriously, or was it just something you put up on uh, I, I really don't think they took them seriously, uh, but it was something that we're, we were supposed to do and we did, and we did. Did you participate in any other activities uh, regarding the war effort before you went in? Scrap drives or rationing or...? Well, well like I say, the war broke out <clears throat> in December 41, and I went into the service. I actually reported, okay, I, I was home about a year, a little over a year, from the time the war to, between Pearl Harbor and when I left. I was home about a, a little over a year. Because <clears throat> I was, uh, when Pearl, at, at the time of Pearl Harbor, uh, I was 17 years old in November, and Pearl Harbor was bombed in December. Uh, and then I left for the service for like two months after I was 18. Um, no, no, because that first semester from September to till December or January, I was going to college. I was go oh, I, I did take ROTC that first semester. Um, then everybody was leaving. Most of the men were leaving for the service. And uh, I had my choice of, like I say, waiting to be drafted or enlisting. My brother had enlisted in the Air Corps. I did the same thing. And uh, I was able to get into the aviation cadets, which I'm glad I did. And um, uh, September 30th, 1944, I got my wings and my commission. And then in the about July of 45, I returned home. Mm. That's, uh, some other questions come to mind. There's a book that just came out recently called My War by uh, Tracy Sugarman. He was at uh, the University of Syracuse about the same time you were. Uh, I knew him. I knew him, and he had an older brother, Marv. They ran a day camp for boys out on Casanova Lake. And when I was a teenager, uh, one summer, I went to their day camp. He was a little older than me. And when I saw that article, and I remembered him, I remembered Tracy Sugarman and his older brother, Marv Sugarman. Um, and I think they both went to, to Syracuse University, too. I know they lived in the university section. Uh, and, uh, of course, hometown life in Syracuse at that time was going to movies, going to see the Syracuse Chiefs play baseball, going to see the Syracuse University football games, basketball games. Uh, and I, I lived uh, right across the street from my high school, Nottingham High School. I lived right across the street. I was out in the ball field every day playing ball after school. I was in the Nottingham High School band, and then I was in Syracuse University band 
during that first semester that I was that I went to Syracuse before the before I went away. Let's talk about the aviation cadet screening test that you took downtown Syracuse. Do you remember what the test involved? <laughs> Not really, because it was so long ago. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think really that more of the fellows who took them uh, failed than passed. Was it all written work, or were there any manual tests? Or I don't recall any manual tests. It was all written work. And the, and the physical training in the cadets, we used to run and run and run until you thought you were going to drop, especially when we were in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, running around the, the mountains around there. We used to run and run. And I think I heard once that the track coach at the college in Williamsport was our, the, 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 the college track coach was our phys ed instructor and he used to keep us running and running and running. And then when we were in Florida at navigation school and there it was hot, we used to run in the orange groves and in the grapefruit groves and uh, I guess it was an excellent physical training. Uh, very, very hard, very hard physical training in calisthenics. Uh, I'm sure you've gone through that too. Yeah. <laughs> I would have liked to have run through an orange grove. I could have pinched an orange or two in the way. Well, we used to. <laughs> a little quick uh, energy there on the run. Uh huh. So, how did it feel to actually pin on the wings on the board? Well, it felt. I was very proud. I was very proud. Uh, Let's see, that was in 1944, September 44. I wasn't 20 years old. I, I, yeah, right, I wasn't 20 years old yet. I was two months short of 20. And I was a lieutenant at the age of 19. I, was, I felt very proud, and my parents were very proud. And um, uh, oh, yes, I was very happy, very happy about it. And I was very happy that I picked the Air Corps to go into. I liked it. And it, uh, it, uh, it suited me. I mean, I, I liked the, the training. I liked the life. Uh, and I was able to do it. And uh, when I was in high school, three of my math courses, uh, three of my math courses in high school, New York State, there, I don't know if you're from New York State, but in New York State you have regents exams, which everybody in the state has to take them. Uh, in high school, I took three different math regences, algebra, and I think plane geometry, solid geometry, three different math regences, and I got a hundred in each one of them. And I think that helped me in getting into the Air Corps and helped me in the work. I have a friend who I went to high school with and then I went to college with who became an aeronautical engineer he got a 98 on one of the regences, and he wasn't satisfied. He went back to summer school that summer and took it again and got a hundred. <laughs> well, we're about out of this tape. Uh, you got a few minutes? You want to go on and do some more? Sure. All right, Wayne. Why don't we just uh, okay? We'll, we'll uh, kill this tape and in four minutes we. Uh, tape number two, interview of Mr. Sherwin Glazer on 24 January 2001. Um, we had a landmark at our air base uh, which would help us identify our air base when we were coming back. Uh, there were three poplar trees right in the center of the air base and that was like an identification point for us. Uh, another interesting thing which I thought about was um, uh, at first, our bombers used to be painted with camouflage paint, like a greenish paint. Uh, but somebody got the idea that that paint could weigh several hundred pounds on the plane. And why not use those pounds for extra gas load, uh, or which would give us more, more distance, or extra bomb load. 
So after a while they stopped painting the planes and the newer planes that came in were all bright new aluminum. And um, uh, for a while our the B-17 had a very high thin tail and ours, our identification marks were red checkerboard squares, red and aluminum checkerboard squares. It was very easy identif identifiable. Um, well, once I was on a leave, uh, a weekend leave in London, I was sleeping at the Red Cross Club, which was right in downtown London, and <clears throat> I was awakened by an explosion, and I could feel the ground shake, and it was one of these German, I think they were called V-1 or V-2 rockets. They were uh, pilotless rockets that the Germans invented and they used to send over into London. Um, uh, I still am in contact with five members of my crew uh, we never could contact my pilot and co-pilot. We never could find them. We never could. Uh, they were both older than us. Uh, the rest of us, besides the pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator, the rest of us were all about 18 years old when we went into the air car. My pilot was probably about 10 years older than us, and my co-pilot maybe five years older than us, and the radio operator was older than us. Uh, but uh, I'm still in contact with my flight engineer, my bell, ball turret gunner, belly turret gunner, uh, the two waist gunners, and the tail gunner. The tail gunner lives in Houston. He's from Buffalo, but he became, he, he got Parkinson's disease, and the doctor recommended he moved, moved to the south, and they moved to Houston. And my ball turret gunner is a pharmacist in Florida. Uh, one of my waste gunners, he and his brother and father raised horses on a horse ranch in Montana. The other waste gunner uh, lives in a suburb of Salt Lake City. And my uh, flight engineer, Tom Newton, uh, he, after the war, he went to work for a savings and loan association, worked there for many years, worked his way up until he became president of the savings and loan association. He did very well. He bought his own airplane, took flying lessons, bought his own airplane, and still flies. Uh, and I'm in contact with him. So I'm in contact with, uh, there are six of us with, uh, who are in contact with each other. Uh, we could never find my pilot and co-pilot and my radio operator uh, he was coming down from Canada once, down to his home in Pennsylvania, and when he came near Syracuse, he called us, and we arranged to meet at the one of the Route 81 exits. And we went and we met him. We had a nice afternoon talking, and then he went back. He left and he went down to with his wife and family, uh, went down to his home in Allentown, Pennsylvania. We used to correspond with Christmas cards once a year. Then one year I received a letter from his wife and I was afraid of what it contained and I was right. He had passed away uh, in, in his sleep and I guess uh, that might have been 20 years ago. Uh, so I would be, a, so he was about 60 or 65 at that time. And um, so he is the only one that I know of of our crew that passed away. But our pilot and co-pilot, who were both older, we just have not been able to find them, even searching the internet and searching through social security and wh whatever way different ones of us could think of, we have never been able to find them. Uh, we have a uh, reunion every two years. I've been to one of them. Uh, that was at... Uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. So we decided to, while we were going to Omaha, why not visit my cousin who lives in Oklahoma City? And her husband, 
who I knew from Syracuse, was also an Air Corps navigator. He navigated on a B-24 bomber, in the, uh, also in the 8th Air Corps. Um, uh, now, uh, the B-24s that I just mentioned, uh, they were the biggest rival to our bomber, the B-17. Those were the two main heavy bombers uh, of the war in Europe, the B-17 and the B-24. Um, we used to call the B-24s flying coffins, and we didn't like them. We were partial, of course, to the B-17s. Uh, when I was back in the United States at Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I could have received flying time if I would have uh, flown four hours a month in the B-24, and I didn't want to do it. Flying time is 50% extra pay. If you were getting, say, $200 a month regular pay, uh, if you flew four hours during that month, you'd get 50% more or $300. That's what flying pay was. Um, and um, is there anything else that you would like to ask me, yeah. Colonel? Uh, let's see. To talk for a moment about what a typical mission was like for you. I mean, how did your day begin? What was it? Well, like? we would they would wake us up like three or four o'clock in the morning, and um, we would go to breakfast, and then go to briefing, and everybody would have their own briefing. The pilots had their own briefing. The navigators had their own briefing. The bombardiers had their own briefing. Each one had to know certain things. Uh, and a maximum effort, what we used to call a maximum effort, a big mission, we would put up 1,300 bombers. And when you try to figure 1,300 bombers going over the same target, leaving from an area where there are so many air bases, everything has to be timed perfectly, or else there'd be all kinds of collisions in the air. Everything has to be timed perfectly. So, uh, like one crew would take off at one time, another crew would take off at another time, uh, and the different bases, each one would have its own time where they would have to take off you rendezvous at a certain point in the sky, at a certain time, everything has to be timed perfectly. Uh, and when you reach the target, it's just one group after another dropping the bombs. And as I say, if, if it wasn't timed perfectly, uh, there would be all kinds of collisions in the air. So anyhow, we, we'd, we'd be up early in the morning, we'd have breakfast, then we'd have uh, our briefings, and then we'd pile in the jeeps, and they'd take us out to the, out onto the field where our planes were. Uh, there were taxi strips, and then off the taxi strips there were these round areas, which were called hard stands. That's where the planes were stored, each one by itself. Instead of all the planes being lined up, where one enemy bombing mission could wipe out a whole squadron, uh, the planes were kept separately on these hard stands. And uh, we were taken out by jeeps into these hard stands, and uh, there was taxiing, and by the time you got off the ground and, and circled around and rendezvoused, it might be dawn, sun just coming up. And um, uh, as I say, uh, a maximum effort was 1,300 uh, bombers. Uh, one of the famous, bomb, uh, famous missions was Ploesti, which was in Romania. Uh, that was uh, de trying to destroy the oil fields uh, where the Germans were getting the oil for their tanks and airplanes. Uh, another one was the ball bearing works in um, 
Oh, what was the name of that place? It was a, that was a, one of the two famous missions. Schweinfurt. Right, right, that's right. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, that was a famous one, too, because without ball bearings, where are you? Um, and uh, uh, one, one interesting mission coming back from Swine Monday, which was our longest mission, Swine Monday was uh, well, I, let's see, I can't find it right now, but it was, I think, 11 hours, and it was thir over 1,300 miles round trip. Um, we did our bombing, we flew up to the North Sea, and headed west to go back to England. Well, there's a little island in the North Sea called Heligoland. I don't know if it always belonged to Germany or if they just occupied it during the war, but they had anti-aircraft guns on Heligoland. And we were passing Heligoland. Heligoland was off to our right. It was north of us as we were heading west. It was off to our right. And they were shooting at us, their anti-aircraft. And I could see, off to our right, the puffs of flak. We were a little bit out of range, but they were trying to reach us, and they were following us along with their puffs of flak. But they couldn't reach us. We were a little too far away from them. And um, uh, so what was it actually like, though? I mean, you got up, you did the briefings, you went to the hard stand, you got on the planes, you taxied, you grouped, assembled, and, and flew the mission. But what, you, what were you personally doing during most of the mission? Oh, well, keeping track, keeping track of where we were. Uh, keeping track of where we were. Uh, actually, the person who does the navigating is the, is the navigator in the lead plane, which at first we weren't a lead plane, but then we were put into lead crew training and we became a lead crew bomber. Well, when you navigate, you try to keep track of where you are. You try to tell the pilot what course to fly to get to your, to your destination. And uh, you have different things at your disposal. If the weather is clear, you use what they call pilotage. You refer to objects on the ground and you know if you're going right or not. Uh, you know if the wind is drifting you off one way or the other. Another method of navigation is called dead reckoning, where you can't see the ground, and you go by wind speed, uh, your own flight speed, and you go by your compass, and you try to stay on course just with instruments. Then there's celestial navigation, where you use the stars, planets, the moon, and the sun. Uh, flying back from overseas from England to the Azores, when we landed in the Azores, uh, I was taking sun shots, and I could plot where we were by taking sun shots, and that's how I determined my speed, and that's how I knew when we would be at the Azores. That's where I got my ETA from, uh, 1247. And it must have been very difficult, though, working in that tight little space in the nose of the plane, trying to keep an accurate plot. Well, well, it wasn't really that tight. There was enough room, but it is hard working when, when the temperature could be 30 degrees below zero, uh, when you're wear, wearing a heavy flak suit, and, and, where you, and where you've got a gas, uh, uh, oxygen mask on your face. Every, it was a rule of thumb, every, every thousand feet you go up, the temperature drops two degrees. So if you're, if you're up, uh, uh, like if we, we, we could bomb, we, our maximum bombing altitude was 35,000 feet. Well, it could be 70 degrees below the earth temperature. Um, also, uh, in a B-17, if you have to 
bail out for some other reason. And if you're stationed in the nose of the plane, which the navigator and the bombardier are, the escape hatch is on the left side of the nose, underneath, right very close to number two propeller. Very close to it. Too close for comfort. Okay, if you get out, okay. Um, and if you're dropping from 30,000 feet down, you're without oxygen all that time. You're exposed to the cold all that time. And you're also exposed to enemy fighters all that time. So if you make it down, <laughs> you're, you're pretty lucky. Do you ever think about the possibility of being shot down and becoming a POW? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a friend. I was in the 385th bomb group. I have a friend who was in the 100th bomb group, um, which they called the bloody 100th because they took a lot of punishment. Uh, and uh, he spent part of the war in Norway, I believe it was, because uh, he was taken captive. And um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I thought about it. Uh, we used to carry a 45 caliber pistol, automatic pistol. Um, and uh, uh, and we all had we all had machine 50 caliber machine guns, except the pilot and co-pilot. I mean, they were busy busy piloting the plane. But I, I the, even the navigator, uh, I had machine guns which were available for me if I had to use them, 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, the Air Corps had gunnery schools, but I was never sent to a gunnery school. So when we were forming our crew and <coughs> practice and having practice training missions in Florida, they did give us some gunnery training. In fact, one day, something funny developed. We're flying up the coast of Florida and we're firing out toward the ocean. And the pilot turns the plane around and is heading the opposite direction. Some of the guys did not realize it and are firing inland instead of out to the ocean. <laughs> Hopefully nothing happened, uh, but something you, you smile about afterwards. Did you ever have to fire the 50 in combat? No, no. I, I never saw a enemy fighter plane. I never saw it. I saw a lot of flak, but I never saw an enemy fighter plane. Because by the time I arrived overseas and we started flying our missions, most of France had been <coughs> reoccupied by the Allied forces. Uh, and so when we were flying over France, we were flying over friendly territory. Whereas early on, before D-Day, as soon as you crossed the English Channel, you were over enemy territory. And those guys really had it rough. I've always wondered what it must like, what it must have been like to be flying in the nose of a B-17. I mean, what a incredible view. I mean, taking off, landing. Well, I'll tell you, uh, when we were in training over Florida, over central Florida, we were so high, you could see the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the Gulf of Mexico on the other side. You could actually see them both at the same, you know, uh, because you're so high, you can see both, both ways. Uh, but you know, when you're uh, 18, 19, 20 years old, you can do a lot of things that you would not be able to do if you were older. Uh, and, uh, you know, such as flying these missions. Although a lot of guys were older and, and did it. Uh, and um, so it was, and, and it's a good thing that most of the guys were young. And that piece of flak when it came through the fuselage, I mean, it must have given you pause, maybe not during the mission, but afterwards. And think about it, you know, I can get killed. <laughs> oh yeah, oh sure, oh yeah. Well, you know, when you're young 
and you're doing this every day and you know you've got to do it, there's no question about it, you know. Did you have any special rituals or habits you used to use to kind of protect yourself? Well, okay, well, okay, well um, here, here, here's something that I can tell you about. Um, we, when we were going into a, a heavy flak area, they had flak vests. They were cloth with metal inside them. And you put these on to protect you and a, and a steel helmet. And they were so heavy you could hardly move. But they would protect you somewhat. Um, the B-17s were not pressurized cabinets. B-29s, which came later, were pressurized cabinets. We did not have oxygen in our cabinets. We had to wear oxygen masks. We did not have heated cabinets, which the B-29s were heated. We had to wear, we had, at first, we had these heavy leather, sheep-lined, sheepskin-lined, uh, leather jackets and, and pants which went all the way down and those were heavy. We used to wear those. Then they came along with electrical systems where they would have an, an electrical system and you, we had electrically heated flying suits like an electric blanket. We had these electrically heated flying suits which, which would plug in to the electrical system in the plane. And they were an improvement because they weren't bulky and they weren't as heavy. So, uh, uh, and uh, it was Air Corps regulations. When you reach 10,000 feet, you had to go on oxygen. You had to put on your oxygen mask. Uh, you didn't really need it at that, at that altitude, but that was the regulation. At 10,000 feet, uh, you had to go on oxygen. Whereas on a B-29, which came along later, though they had oxygen in the, in the, ca in the cabinets, in the cabins. Uh, so, you know, as the war went on, uh, the instruments were more advanced. Uh, we, had an, we had a very good navigational instrument aid, uh, which the English invented. It was a small box about that big which was mounted uh, in the corner and it had a round screen on it and it had electronic blips and when you lined up the electronic blip you were on course by turning the knobs by lining up the blip you you were, were on course we could come in sometimes it was so foggy when you're in the traffic pattern you can't even see the runway. But with these, with this instrument, by lining up the blips, you could come right in on the runway without even seeing it. And then, of course, when you get low enough, then you will see it. And that was called a G-box. And that was invented by the English, by the RAF people. Uh, we used to fly in formation in the daytime. And the RAF flew at night, one plane uh, at a time. And that was the difference. They did nighttime bombing, and we did daytime bombing. Did your plane have a name? Hell's Bells. But like I, like I explained to Wayne, uh, you really didn't have your own plane. Uh, you had a plane that you used most of the time, but uh, one day another crew might use it. You know, it's really, what, it wasn't really your own plane. And when I said before that we flew, our own bomber overseas, when we went overseas, that was a brand new plane that was just manufactured. Well, we didn't keep that when we got overseas. We had a used plane <laughs> over there, and somebody else got that. <laughs> well, let's skip ahead to, uh, to after the war. Yes. You go back to college. Yeah. And uh, a lot of students going under the GI Bill? Oh, yes, yes, a lot of students, a lot of, a lot of fellas. Uh, a lot of fellows going, uh, going to college, and there was a discharge button called the Ugly Duckling, they called it, I think. Ruptured duck? A ru a ru yeah, right, oh, that was it. And um, the co-eds, when they looked at a, at a 
fellow student, they'd look and see if he had that pin. And, and they preferred the fellows that did have the pin. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, they were, they were older for one thing. And uh, I suppose they liked the idea of a little older fellow, maybe a little more experienced. But, How else did all those GIs affect campus life? Well, they were good students, and they were serious students. Uh, the Syracuse University had put up uh, these tin barracks behind, are you familiar with the campus up there, Krause mm -hmm. College? Well, okay, there, there's a big area up there between buildings that was all filled with these uh, barracks that, that they had put up. Over on Calvin Street, they had put up uh, barracks for married students. And there were all kinds of uh, things that to accommodate the, uh, the servicemen. And, uh, and of course the servicemen went to college free. Um, and uh, they even paid the servicemen, if I recall, I think I was getting $100 a month to live on. And I paid no tuition. Before the war, tuition was something like $200 a semester compared to what it is now, like 15,000 or something like that. Um, yes, yeah, so, so there was a big influx of, uh, of students, of male students, uh, and, uh, and the co-eds used to look to see uh, if the fellow was wearing a, uh, a discharge button or not. <laughs> Do you think the GI Bill made a difference in your life? Uh, did it make a difference in my life? Um, well, in other words, are, are you asking me if, would I have continued in mm -hmm. college? Uh, when I came back at first, I really, I really didn't know if I wanted to continue college because I'd been away three years. And um, frankly, uh, but I did. If I had had to pay for it, maybe I wouldn't. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know. But I were, even even with it being paid for by the GI Bill, I really thought twice about going back to school because I'd been away three years. But uh, uh, I guess the fact that maybe it, it, the, the government was paying for it, maybe that it did help in my decision. Do you feel like the missions you flew with the 8th Air Force, did they make a difference in the war? Oh, I, I think absolutely. I think the thing that beat the Germans was our bombing their industry. I think there's no doubt about that. They had no industry left. Their, their military machine was ruined by our bombing. They had nothing left. And I think it's our bombing that did it. I think that was the biggest thing in the war. Of so, course, it did not eliminate we had to send in ground troops at the end, but it would have been much worse for the ground troops without that bombing. Lillian, my wife, had a brother who served in D-Day, invaded, um, you know, uh, when they invaded uh, from the English Channel there, Normandy, mm -hmm. uh, and he said that the, these ground soldiers were so happy and thrilled when they saw American bombers heading overhead, heading into Germany. They were thrilled to see it. And I really do think, oh, I think our, our bombing, I think, made all the difference in the world. I really do think so. Because we used to destroy their railroad yards, we used to destroy their factories, and, and, and even airfields. So you feel like you were part of something bigger and, and greater? Well, uh, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. You're proud of having served in World War II? Yeah, oh yes, yes, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have a friend, this friend who's in the nursing home up in Watertown. He was a, a fighter pilot, an Air Corps fighter pilot, but he was never sent overseas. 
and he feels very guilty about it. And I told him, well, listen, it wasn't your doing. You weren't sent overseas. Uh, but he does feel very guilty about it. Um, uh, there were, we, we had uh, two main uh, fighter planes in Europe during the war. The P-51, which was the, I think, the best one. And I think that's the one that they had the most of, and the P-47. Um, and then there was one called a P-38, which was put out by Lockheed. Instead of having one fuselage, it had twin fuselage. And it was joined by the two, the two fuselages were joined by the wings. I don't know if you ever saw a picture of that or not. Um, and, uh, but they, they didn't use an awful lot of those for some reason, I don't know. But the P-51 was really a great plane. And that's what my friend, he was a P-51 pilot, but for some reason he was never sent overseas. When you look back at it now, is there anything in particular that sticks out in your memory more than anything else about your wartime service? Well, the missions, the missions do. They were scary. They were scary, uh, and like I say, that first night in the barracks when my brother was there with me, my first night there, this one fella was having nightmares, and, uh, and he woke up the rest of the barracks because he was crying out. And um, they had a, down on the southern coast of England, uh, on the coast of the English Channel, uh, there was Bournemouth, a city by the name of Bournemouth, where they had um, what they called R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. After you'd flown a certain number of missions, they sent you there uh, to rejuvenate you. Um, and uh, oh yeah, I was very, I was very glad that I went. And. Uh, And uh, I feel the better for it. And the government, I have no complaint with the government. The government paid for my college. And because I am a veteran, I get a deduction on my real estate tax, which I think is wonderful. I mean, uh, I, was in the, I was in the service not quite three years. And for the whole rest of my life, I'm getting a deduction on my real estate tax which I think is fabulous. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think I've covered most of everything. Uh, I could mention a crazy thing like in um, my basic training in Atlantic City, you go through a, in the mess hall, you go through the line and you don't help yourself to the food, there's somebody dishing it out. And they slap it onto your tray, <coughs> and this guy slaps on my tray a portion of butter about that big, and they make you eat everything that's on your tray. I thought I was going to die eating all that butter once. And um, um, I made some good friends in the service. Uh, my, the fellows in my crew were in contact all the time. And um, I, um, I ran into a little bit of religious prejudice in the service. One of my instructors said to me one day, is my father a tailor? Uh, he knew that I was Jewish. You know, on your dog tags, you have your <coughs> the initial of your religion. Uh, he asked me if my father was a tailor. And I guess a lot of, in those years, a lot of Jewish men were tailors. It sort of made me feel like he was classifying me in his mind uh, 
you know, it's like if I had a, if, it's like if I had a, a Greek fellow, and I said to this fellow, Greek fellow, does your father run a restaurant? Or, or if I said to an Italian fellow, is your father a barber? Uh, and um, so that sort of annoyed me at the time, but I was 18 years old and he was an instructor. And, you know, you just sort of roll with the punches. Were there any other episodes of anti-Semitism? Nothing really. That was the only really thing that was directed against me personally. Nothing really, nothing really else. You, you know, you find people grouped together. Uh, we had, uh, I don't think that we had any African Americans in our, that, that I could see in the aviation cadets. Of course, I mean, I, that doesn't mean there weren't any. But at least that I could see, I can't remember any aviation cadets that were African Americans. And probably that was due to the fact that at first you had to be a college graduate to get in it. And um, uh, and I think a part of it was due to, a lot of it was due to education. Uh, so. Uh, there was, you know, I guess there was a lot of prejudice. There was a lot of prejudice, but a lot of it is subtle. Um, well, we're coming down to the last few minutes on the tape, so yeah. is there anything else that you wanted to uh, mention? Uh, I think the government uh, was very, very good to the veterans of World War II. Now, I, I understand that the same thing was not true of Vietnam. I don't know. I don't know because it's not my experience. But I think the, 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 the government was excellent to veterans of World War II. Now, I wasn't wounded. Maybe if I had been wounded, maybe there are wounded veterans that don't feel that way. But I think the government was very good to uh, veterans of World War II. And uh, I'm glad that I went. And uh, I'm proud that I went. And um, and I look back at it as not as a, uh, I mean, nobody's happy to risk your life, but but uh, I'm glad I did it, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad I came home okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you.